So thank you for that. Thank you for also coming to something that just said Crest presentation on the on the invitation. I actually provided a much more detailed definition of what it was I was going to talk about, so, so I apologise for that. Um, anybody who saw Steve Boner's um, presentation earlier this morning, then I've taken his approach of, first of all, talking about my holidays. So, so this is RSA. This is a much better thing than swimming in cold water. So, so, and really the reason for putting this up in terms of making sure we have some theme to it so that I can claim that hiring a motorcycle should be charged to Crest is that I've been a geek for a very long time, um, really before it was sexy and professional. And, um, and therefore I think I look really cool. But if you look at the picture of me on that Indian in RSA, then you can see I lost one of my lenses out of my sunglasses and I didn't know for half a day. And the Americans never told me, really. They thought it was something medical and therefore didn't tell me. And also in the Steve Bonner thing, I also think you should actually have a hat. So, so the best thing to do at RSA is to hire an Indian motorcycle and go to Palo Ultra much better than trying to swim across the ocean for no apparent reason and potentially get eaten by sharks. So, so that's the background to it. Um, I've been doing this um, type of work for a very long time now. So, so more than, uh, it's almost 40 years. Um, and therefore, I've seen a lot of things, but I think right now there is significant changes happening in the industry and stuff that I think that the industry should be aware of and should actually try and address. Uh, for those of you who don't know Crest, Crest has four primary purposes. Uh, that is the accreditation of companies through our company membership scheme. In the UK, we have 87 companies that cover threat intelligence, penetration testing, cyber security related incident response. Um, in Australia, we have 26 members. In Southeast Asia, we now have eight members, but that's increasing quite quickly. Uh, I run some schemes on behalf of the NSA in, in the United States. That gives me about 16 NSA-type members and about four US members. Um, so the whole um, envelope in terms of opening up that professionalization of the industry is happening quite quickly and really to some of the standards that we've set. We combine that with our professional qualifications, and again, if this was a fuller room full of all the young people that should be here, uh, then what we're talking about there is trying to move forward with around about um, 1,800 hours after a really good degree course. So if you're at Abate, for example, doing some of the technical network security stuff, um, then I think you stand half a chance with a couple of work placements uh, to be able to step in and do our lowest level exam, which is our practitioner level. We then step up from that to registered around about 6,000 hours, and then our certified about 10,000 hours, and we retest people every three years. And then there's some specialist areas that's going on. Uh, ultimately, we're moving towards a fellowship model as well, and then we're also working with some other organisations looking at a formal charter, uh, which is very much in, in line with some of the work that's been done in physicians, for example. So that chartered status is a really important thing. And I think what we've done is we've leapfrogged a number of areas of IT. Um, we've come from a backwater technical penetration testing area to actually be probably one of the more professional areas of the IT industry. We tie the professional qualifications and the membership together with codes of conduct. Um, basically, if an organisation fails its code of conduct, and I, can and I can demonstrate that, there is absolutely justification for removing somebody. Um, then they can't do work for the Bank of England in the UK. That would take them out of um, financial services authority work, top tier UK financial services. I have a back-to-back -back agreement with GCHQ, so if they're part of the check scheme, we get them removed from that as well. I have a back-to-back -back agreement with the NSA. They don't go on the incident response schemes for the NSA. And I'm having similar arrangements being put in place for Hong Kong, Malaysia and Singapore, as well as some of the other European central countries. So all of a sudden, that stick for actually doing things in a professional way is quite significant. We tie that together with the individual codes of conduct as well. And again, it's incumbent on the individual doing that type of work to understand the organisations they work for. Underneath that, we then do knowledge sharing and professional development. We don't do training. We only do the certification. We believe there's a potential conflict of interest at the professional level, and it's not what other professions do. Uh, but our knowledge sharing is broken down into running development workshops for, for people within the industry. And primarily, they look at two areas. So we look at development of the industry itself. We're currently looking at um, SOC accreditation. There's an international workshop doing an awful lot of work on that at the moment. We're looking at industrial control systems. Uh, there's a document that's uh, just about to rele be released in conjunction with um, CPNI, the, the Cabinet Office part of the UK government. Um, and then we combine those sorts of activities with what we believe is our social responsibility. So, so our gender balance within our industry, we're trying to actively address by pulling together a lot of the women's groups and making sure they're adequately addressed and making sure we're improving the marketing message. And at the same time, we work with people like the National Crime Agency on intervention points to stop young people going into cybercrime. 
and some of that links into some of the work we also do with the National Autism Society. So a lot of it is really relevant stuff in terms of trying to professionalise the image of the industry and trying to make sure that we're providing tools and processes to, to help us. The professional development, we tied very much together with our academic partners, and there's a really good academic partner programme. Again, student membership is available for free. We have about 160 hours worth of professional content available on our YouTube channels, and again, that's all free. So access to really good information on both careers and in terms of up-to-date information about what's happening in the industry is there. And then we tie that together with, again, things like our conference, Crestcom, which we're going to run uh, next week. Uh, moving into the areas, then I've mentioned a couple of schemes. Schemes is a really odd word that's used quite a lot in the industry. Our definition of a scheme is the combination of some form of company accreditation with some form of professional membership for the individuals carrying out that work. So in other words, the buying community has access to a trusted organisation who utilises skilled, knowledgeable and competent individuals. That's the way that we define it. There's a number of things that we do. So I've mentioned the Crest penetration testing, uh, but we also do cybersecurity incident response. There's a scheme for that called a CSIR scheme. That's a prerequisite for the government's CIR scheme, which is the um, cyber incident response scheme, and that's for state-sponsored attack, very serious organised crime, and other areas of threat that the UK security authorities may be interested in. In addition to the incident response, then we run the Syria scheme on behalf of the NSA, so we do all the accreditations for the US-based companies on their major incident response scheme as well. Again, state-sponsored attack, very serious organised crime, is their primary areas, and now we're looking to extend that out. We're also working with the NSA in terms of looking at vulnerability assessment organisations, and I think, again, that's something we're trying to encourage the UK government to look at in collaboration. That international collaboration is really important. Um, we also then run some other ones. Right at the bottom of the tree, then we've got Cyber Essentials. Um, again, we're the architects of Cyber Essentials. The UK government hasn't quite implemented it in the way that we envisaged, so I really like the standard. I think there are some slight issues with the way it's been implemented, but again, I think it's a good indication of basic cyber hygiene. Cyber Essentials Plus is what all organisations should be aiming for, and it's the minimum standard that we put in place. Um, and then we start to run right at the other end of the scale some of the critical national infrastructure areas. Um, so we have something called STAR, which is Simulated or Situational Targeted Attack and Response. A combination of threat intelligence and red teaming really is what we're talking about there. Um, what we've done is we were asked to do that as a generic and then extend it out to areas of the critical national infrastructure. So the one we've done so far is CBEST over here, which is for the Bank of England. Uh, they've looked at so far the 35 of the 36 systemic risk areas uh, that are within the UK financial services. This isn't losing a number of people's accounts. This is if you take the interconnectivity between the banking system in the UK down, then the UK economy suffers significantly. So it's that level of, of impact, real proper net, uh, critical national infrastructure stuff. And then we've just launched TBEST, which is for the telecommunications agency with Ofcom, DCMS, and also with um, the six major telecom providers in the UK who are all bought on. Uh, in actual fact, they're competing with each other to be the first organisation to go through a T-Best activity. At which point, if you combine things like check and you combine things like some of the other things that I've been mentioning, you, you think it's quite a crowded, confusing landscape. In, in actual fact, we have a strategy and, and we understand how a lot of these things all fit together. But really what we're trying to do is to look at elements associated with trying to reduce the threat reduce the vulnerability, avoid, detect and recover. Avoidance, I don't think, is really an option anymore. The idea that you don't go on the internet shopping or you don't do transactions over the internet or you just block everything off is really not an option. Even in the industrial control systems area, we're seeing really quite critical industrial control systems being linked onto internet gateways so they can remotely manage and remotely monitor. Um, at that point, all of the physical air gapping that's gone on in terms of old industrial control systems just goes completely out the window. So what we're trying to do really is reduce threat, reduce vulnerability, detect and recover. If you take that first one, um, as I say, I've been doing this for a long time and, and really the concept of reducing the threat has been something we've talked about a lot. In actual fact, we haven't done hardly anything about it at all. In actual fact, whenever we've talked about reducing threat, generally we've been talking about reducing vulnerabilities. So reducing threat is really trying to dissuade people from going into the sort of ad adversarial, so in other words, the attack scenarios, to try to attack our systems, or have the judicial system that is actually in place that would make that unattractive for somebody to move into that area. Given that cyber-related um, crime is, is the most um, 
fast increasing sector in, in that particular marketplace. And some people are saying it's already exceeded uh, the drug trafficking, which is just quite incredible. Um, and there is good indications that even if that isn't true, we're talking about serious amounts of money here, then that reduction of threat side of things really hasn't worked and we need to do more on it. Crest can't do that alone and our Crest members can't, but what we are trying to do is to work with other agencies like the National Crime, uh, National Crime Agency, the NCA, uh, Titan from Met Police. We're starting to work with Europol and Interpol to try to look at the intervention points to stop young people going into cybercrime. On our stand downstairs, then we've got this particular guide. Uh, this has formed part of the NCA strategy for, for, for rent. We've started to work with the counter-terrorism people, uh, the anti-gang people and the sexual grooming people to look at the social engineering aspects associated with trying to reduce the threat of young people going into crime in this area. And there is absolute evidence that people are being groomed into this space um, systematically and on volume. So anything we can do with this on an international stage, really important. If anybody wants to contribute to any of that or have got ideas about intervention points that we can include within the program, then please come and talk to us. The next thing is penetration testing, and that's what Crest is most, um, most known for, and the implementation of technical standards to reduce vulnerabilities. So really the penetration testing side of things is, is a really important aspect. What we're trying to do there is to identify vulnerabilities within systems and organisations, trying to exploit those in some form or another, and then provide security improvement programmes in terms of the technical content. Absolutely what we should be trying to do. Uh, the difficulty with that is what type of penetration test should we do? If you're a small organisation with hardly any assets, no links on to personal information or financial records, that's significantly different from critical national infrastructure. So how do you work out as a buyer what it is you should be buying and procuring in this particular area? In addition to that, if we do penetration tests and we don't actually put the results of those tests in a way that's understandable to management, we're really struggling and we're not necessarily doing a particularly good job. And if we don't tie those into some of the other technical standards, and even some of the management standards like 27001. In other words, if the recommendations don't go into the security improvement plan, then we're in a real difficult place because we're not being heard in terms of the recommendations that, that are being suggested. We're working very closely with, with people like BSI, BSI are a member, uh, but we're also working with LRQA and some of the other people from the standards institutions to try to understand how some of the statements they make about penetration testing actually link in to what we should be doing in terms of standards in this area. And I think relatively soon we'll see much more technically competent things coming out. You could argue that the 27001 review should already cover those sorts of things. The difficulty I have is that the, um, the auditors, some of the senior auditors, are not tech. Um, so in other words, they can't even read a vulnerability assessment report. They're traditional auditors looking at policy, process and control without too much on the control element. My argument is the standard's not wrong. What we need to do is to upskill the audit community, as I think we need to do in terms of upskilling some of the accreditation people that are doing work on behalf of governments throughout the world. So we need to upskill as well as bringing new talent on. But that concept of tying those two things together is really important to us. If you then look at some of those schemes and some of those approaches, then we can start to think about how we break this stuff down. So right at the bottom of the stack here, we've got vulnerability analysis. We then got defined scope penetration testing. So this is, we want you to test this website or this piece of kit or this piece of IoT device. So in other words, we're just testing this almost from a security perspective in the same way as we would performance analysis and other things. We then move on to um, objective led. So in other words, we're trying to do, we're trying to find a particular flag within a quite a confined set. So in other words, we're still doing penetration testing. It's slightly broader, but it's still objective led in terms of getting validation and assurance that a particular functional service is secure. We then move up to a simulated targeted attack and response. And at this point here, this is what the UK would call red teaming. In the US, they, they use the term red teaming for almost anything from, from vulnerability assessment upwards. Uh, but from our perspective, this is using highly skilled individuals that are fully cognizant of the impact they would have if such tests go wrong, put it into a proper management framework and combining that with threat intelligence. Now, that's a significantly different position than what we're doing at the bottom here. And what we're trying to do there is to actually align the level of assurance required by the, by the threat to the organisation. And I think at that point, our buyers will understand what they should be buying, and they should hopefully be more intelligent in the way they buy those services. 
If you look particularly at the vulnerability analysis side of things, as we're seeing more automated attack tools, what we're also seeing is better and more automated vulnerability assessment tools. And I think as an industry, we are looking at the past. So again, if you look at institutions like this, the concept of a paramedic or even a paralegal, um, those sorts of things in terms of the profession are disappearing. The use of artificial intelligence and some form of big data analytics are absolutely getting rid of that concept of a para person. And I think in our industry, we have the opportunity to look at that from a tool outcome perspective to understand what services have been provided by vulnerability assessment <coughs> organisations and to do that in a more pragmatic way. But you can see all of a sudden, we then start to have a stack that we can start to apply, which allows us to start to answer this question about how do we decide what level of penetration testing is required or even what level of incident response is required in terms of understanding our organisations and what they look like and what types of services they should be procuring. Because at that point, we can then start to look at the stack in reverse. So the very small businesses, no access to financial information or personal information. Cyber essentials, probably good enough. Again, I think there should be a vulnerability assessment in there, and that's what the Crest version of um, Cyber Essentials uh, requires, because we need to validate that if somebody says they have a firewall in place, they've actually, first of all, bought one. Secondly, they've taken it out of the box, and then thirdly, they've put it somewhere sensible on the network. Um, the first level without that form of assessment doesn't really do that. The next level up from that, we do some desktop review, but again, very basic, but we're looking at small organisations, and we've tried to align with PCI DSS. So in other words, things you would be required to do from the payments industry, we hopefully are replicating those throughout other industries. And then you move into penetration testing, and I think that should probably be cut in half. I think there are two elements associated with that with slightly different approaches. And then at the top level there, we've got threat intelligence-led penetration testing or red teaming with Intel. So at that bottom level, Cyber Essentials, um, really simple, five mandatory controls. I quite like it. Um, obviously, we can add some more stuff in there, but, but basically, secure configuration, not an unreasonable thing to ask for. Boundary and firewall and internet connections, access control and ac administrative access, particularly on privileged accounts, is still quite incredible. I'm amazed, really, by why people don't look at that at all. A patch management, still a major problem. So we designed Cyber Essentials for small enterprise. That's, that was the homework that we were given to go away and look at this. And now it's being applied to very large organisations. Um, I think that's quite a difficult thing to do because of the scoping aspects. But the really interesting thing is we've got large organised failing uh, on patch management and boundary and firewall internet gateways. Quite incredible. Um, and uh, driving this, you can't even get on the first rung of the ladder in terms of basic cyber hygiene for a large organisation providing services to government. It's a scary place to be. And then finally, malware protection. Again, the, the move towards ransomware. I could do another whole presentation on ransomware, but I was standing in the US about three weeks ago next to a children's cancer charity who had just been ransomware for $9,000. These people are really not very nice. Um, that's the way it does. Self-assessment, we require a vulnerability scan at all levels, and then we do an internal assessment in terms of the, the desktop build. Um, the interesting thing about this is that I think what we're trying to do by things like Cyber Essentials is to manage our existing threat profile. So what we're now seeing is, is a flood on the marketplace of available attack tools. Um, help YouTube videos that tell you how to extract the money, um, security attack on demand, um, we rate them, you know, so, so you only go to a, a well-rated attack organisation to help you. There's some money-back guarantees, so if you can't actually extract ransomware and you don't make any money at it, they will give you your money back. You know, this is quite an interesting trust model in the business. So what does that say to me? I'm a business person. Right? I'm not a very nice business person at that point because I'm attacking children's charities. Um, but I'm making a shed load of money really a shed load of money. So what would I do with that money? I'd invest in my second generation tools. But what I've got is a legacy system here. So as a business person, I look at that legacy and I think, well, that's got a reasonable tail on it. What I'm going to do is maximise the amount of money I'll get from that. I'll flood it onto the marketplace and make it available to other people. That will also confuse the, the defence industry because they'll be so busy looking at this stuff, which is now being proliferated, uh, that they won't be looking at my more advanced attacks. And that, I'm absolutely sure, is what's happening. If I was doing that and I was looking at my marketing department and bearing in mind these organisations have huge amount of data and very good marketing departments, I'd be using artificial intelligence, big data analytics uh, to make sure that people open uh, emails, make sure they're absolutely addressed to the right person, 
in a language they're expecting, at a time they're expecting, on a subject they're expecting. And I'd be using my big data analytics to make sure I'm targeting people on a, on a very consistent basis. So in other words, using whaling, but on a mass base. And that's what I think we're moving towards. And therefore, a lot of this basic cyber hygiene is going to be no good for the future. And we really should be investing in this in terms of an industry to think about what we're going to do in terms of next generation attack tools. Very scary. And at the moment, my only answer is go to the cloud if you're a small organisation. The idea of having a corner shop, having the mafia knocking on your door, pretty scary place to be. And I don't know how you're going to protect yourself, particularly as the police wouldn't come. So this no recognition for good standards is another really interesting thing. So if you take, we will issue a certificate of Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus, awesome. You put five basic controls in place and you've got a little bit of configuration on your desktop build, you know, magnificent, really good. But the next level up, you get nothing. So at that point, we have to think about how we reward organisations for doing better. And again, looking at that, what we need to do is the more formal links into those existing security standards. It should form part of 27001 and form part of the certification service. We should look at trying to give something to the, the chief information officers and the, those responsible for security for doing a good job in relation to the types of threats the organisation is exposed to. And that link with our existing standards is something we haven't done particularly well yet, but we are working really hard to try to, to, to correct that. Um, it's in a difficult thing because if you take the ISO change cycle, it takes a very long time, which is why we've never gone the ISO route in terms of Crest, uh, because we evolve so quickly. But that link into that, I think, will provide the opportunity, providing that reward for organisations doing more. We also need to establish minimum standards that aren't too prescriptive and can evolve quickly. So again, if you look at 27001, you would look at the control set that's available to you, you look at the statement of applicability, you can basically say, I accept that level of risk. I don't think in certain instances you should be able to accept a level of risk for a basic cyber hygiene control, or if you're running part of the critical national infrastructure full of water or gas, really, I don't think that's an appropriate thing to do. So I do think we should look at those statements of applicability and we need to look at those in terms of minimum standards and I think there needs to be some refinement according to the sector and type of organisation you're operating within but I don't think it's beyond the wit of man to actually understand how to do that and how to put some proper stuff in place for minimum standards. And again, that could give us that opportunity for providing a further level of certification but I think that should probably be done through the ISO committees. Critical national infrastructure. So then we jump, really, from that bottom and mid-tier up to, up to the areas. Critical national infrastructure, really interesting on a global basis. Everybody is scared. Rightly so, I think. I, I had an academic um, come back to us um, in response to something we'd written um, last week who said, this isn't really a problem, it's just all being made up. Really? You think about the massive amount of opportunity is for ransomware if you took down a national grid. You imagine the, the chaos we could cause. You look at some of the relationships between very serious organised crime and some of the, um, the governmental systems throughout the world. They are very close, very close, and they live, they live together. We got a request from the Israeli government, bearing in mind the Israelis at the moment for Department for International Trade is a very friendly uh, nation for us to deal with, um, but they're asking for exploits. They're asking Crest member companies, have you got any exploits that you'd like to sell us that we might stick in our back pocket? If you don't think that's attack, I think, again, you'd be very surprised. And even our government is now coming out and saying what we need to do is, is to have some form of offensive capability in this space. That sends some quite strong messages to, to the rest of the world. Uh, if we're doing it and we're quite conservative, um, then certainly the Americans will do it um, because they're shouting about it quite a lot. And you can imagine what the rest of the world is doing in terms of that. This is a real problem. And what we need to do is to address it on a global basis. I used to work for Siemens. Siemens is responsible for a lot of the industrial control systems kit, and, and a lot of that used to get taken down. Um, so I can say that because it was a long time ago, and, and hopefully they've corrected it. Um, but if you look at that, then there are certain tools and, and processes and bits of kit that's available in industrial control systems that need to be improved in terms of their security offering. And at the moment, we're not putting pressure on those suppliers to do that. And I think, again, with some form of strategy for the critical national infrastructure on a global basis, we should be doing that. What we were asked to do by the UK government and, uh, and some other organisations uh, was to look at our existing penetration testing services and to identify an approach that would be suitable for critical national infrastructure. 
Basically, we looked at the side elements, the skill, knowledge, and competence of the individual, OWASP standards, company research, etc., and, and put all that together in terms of this is what a good penetration test looks like. Well, what's missing from that is internet information that you get through CERT UK and other CERTs throughout the world, and then up-to-date threat intelligence, the emergence of the threat intelligence industry. We haven't tied down CERT UK, I'll be really honest, so I haven't drawn down the information about incidents as much as I'd like. The information exchanges, I think, are working very well, but we haven't integrated that information flow into our processes. Uh, but the up-to-date threat intel is absolutely something we've been doing, and that emergence of the threat intelligence industry, for the first time ever, Bearing, how, bearing in mind how old I am and how long I've been talking about threat, is the first time ever I can actually almost put my hand on my heart and say we're actually doing something about threat. And we are monitoring it and we are doing it from a geopolitical perspective, a big data analytics perspective. We are looking at specific dark web analysis and we're looking at individual targets and organisations. In doing that, that emerging threat intelligence industry is really, uh, I think, a fantastic thing. The problem I have with that, going back to the motorcycle picture, is that last year when I went to RSA, everybody had threat intel on their stand. I walked around, nobody did threat intel. Some of them had a sock, some of them had a piece of software that gathered some information and maybe sent out some alerts. Everybody looked at how much Mandiant was worth, I think really, and thought, well, I'm probably going to up my value of my organisation by three, four points by putting threat intel in there, and added it in, really without very much consideration. We do a lot of analysis in terms of how suitable an organisation is. And I think, again, we're, help, we're helping very quickly to, to mature that marketplace. But this emerging threat intelligence industry is really interesting because we can do it for intelligence-led penetration testing. So the concept behind that is what we're trying to do is do an evidence-based and contextualised penetration test. So in other words, when we go back and present to senior boards, we're not saying, here's a whole pile of IP addresses, here's some of the vulnerabilities, Hopefully we've got rid of some of the false positives and maybe you might want to do something about your configuration management. What we are saying is we are seeing on the dark web this type of an attack. These are the types of advocates that are coming through. This is how they're targeting your organisation. This is what they're doing about it. And this is how we've proved that you're vulnerable and therefore you really need to be doing stuff on this. Otherwise you're exposed and you're going to be exposed in the short term. None of this, we've got a five-year window where I'm not going to be managing director anymore and I've gone. This is, this could happen tomorrow, and you're going to be standing up in front of a PAC committee trying to explain to the government why you failed. And if you look at all the GDPR stuff, you know, at that point, I, I think you're buggered, really. Not a term I'd normally use in public, but I really think you're in a difficult position. So this evidence-based, contextualised, threat intelligence-led penetration testing is capturing the imagination around the world, and the UK is leading this big time. We have massive opportunities for taking that early adopter benefit, and again, what we should be doing as an industry supported by government is to pull those things together into a more strategic objective. Coming into that, then, as I've mentioned before, we're already running two schemes on behalf of the UK. So we're running something called CVEST, which is the thing that's run on behalf of the Bank of England. It's their scheme, uh, but we provide the certifications for the individuals and we do all the heavy lifting on the accreditations for the companies. And we're doing the same thing for telecommunications. In the UK, we're also working with the Civil Nuclear, and I'm starting to talk to Rail, and I'm starting to talk to the space agencies. So we are starting to pull together some of those things. In Hong Kong, there's something called ICAST, which is the equivalent of CBEST, and we're supporting that through the Hong Kong government. Uh, Singapore are very close on their heels in terms of trying to do the same type of thing. Uh, in Holland, you've got something called Tiber, which is being used by the um, existing Crest member companies and Crest qualified individuals. They haven't actually developed the scheme in such a structured way as I'd like to see, but they're implementing that. And then we're starting to have further conversations with the European Central Bank to look at rolling this out through 23 European countries, despite us leaving Europe. So, so really, they're continuing to talk to us because we are the best game on the street and probably the only people that can actually drive this process forward in terms of raising the level of professionalisation. What I want to do in there is to identify a strategy. So this is Ian's idea of, of what this might look like. This should be the government strategy in terms of what this should look like. So what we're trying to do here is move from financial services, there is a check plus, it's actually called GBEST now, which is horrible, uh, that they're looking at. Um, but the idea is you've got telecommunications supported by space and transport, because you can't run telecommunications without space. And then on the energy side, you can't do anything without energy, so we're trying to protect that. 
Once we've done that as a little group, we then drop down to the emergency services through the other areas of the critical national infrastructure and what it looks like. There, there is an idea about how we can do this within the UK. And again, I think if we can adopt this fast enough, it is a global offering that the UK can take to a global market and use uh, the cyber security industry as, as being one of the new industry leaders in this particular space in terms of export opportunities, as well as demonstrating good governance within our own, our own model. So this is what we're trying to do. What I'm then suggesting is that we have a domestic CNI strategy group that pulls together. I'm already doing that. I'm trying to pull together the existing people into one place and then having a primary contact group and the liaison for people on the ground. So a, a strategic group and then an operational group. And then tying that together with the international strategy group, I'm already talking to Singtel about telecommunications. And as I've indicated to you, we're already talking to the financial services authority throughout the world. And then tying that together with the international CNI community group as well. So in actual fact, sharing this information about what we're doing in terms of vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, and threat intelligence. <coughs> and then having <coughs> suitable representatives from the regulator, nominated government departments, and for the UK at the very least, the NCSC. And again, what we're trying to do there is make sure the information flows are going backwards and forwards. The, the idea behind this is that China is being attacked in exactly the same way. They are investing more in IPR than the UK and Europe is combined. Um, so again, they are subject to these types of attacks and ransomware. They're going to be the biggest users of technology in the world. Absolutely, their population is being attacked by ransomware and other things that, that we've seen already. And again, the idea that we can only have friends or foes is quite a US perspective of life. There, there are bad guys and good guys is the way that I, I, don't, I don't like to describe it, but it's terms that they use a lot. But in actual fact, what we have is very serious organised crime groups. Uh, we have lesser organised crimes groups, and then we have organisations and individuals that need protecting. And I don't care whereabouts in the world they are. Uh, what we should all be doing is trying to reduce the threat and therefore reduce the recovery time for, for organisations. The interesting thing about that is we can then start to exercise things. So, so at that point, um, I used to be a, a fellow at a business continuity planning institute, and I, and I stopped paying my fees because they wouldn't talk to me about cyber attacks. It was all about what happens when we have the next flood or we lose the power supply or the disk break. And I'm saying we've really got to think about this stuff because we need to tie in monitoring and logging. We need to have all sorts of other stuff to enable us to do it. Even now, I think the big four should be looking at this from a boardroom uh, perspective. So, for example, if you pay ransomware, so you look at this, $9,000 to actually recover something, that's a bargain, really, in terms of what it would cost you to reconstitute. But if you pay that and you can insure against it, which is a really odd thing, um, then in actual fact, you and you could trace the money, undoubtedly some of that money is going to go to organised crime, that's illegal. Undoubtedly some of that is going to be used for funding terrorists, absolutely illegal. So you imagine standing up there going, yep, we paid, and then somebody else from, a, from the BBC stands up and says, do you realise you funded organised crime? Surely that isn't the most appropriate thing, and you should have had appropriate controls in place. That is not somewhere where I'd like to be. And that debate about the ethics associated with it with the board, I've got no idea what Green meant. Perfect. Because um, I forgot, sorry about that. Um, it's, it's a really interesting concept. And there's a number of other issues in terms of the ethics associated with what we're doing in this particular space. This allows us to exercise our continuity plans against real-life scenarios, and again, using that threat intelligence. And then we can start to tie that in in terms of incident response for cyber-related issues. That detection for us is really important. And what we actually want to do is to move towards a continual threat monitoring perspective. So in other words, we've got our SOCs, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. But in addition to that, what we've actually got is the opportunity for doing continual threat monitoring. So the idea behind that is that the moment the threat uh, analysis we're using for things like CBEST and TBEST are looking specifically at your organisation at a particular point in time. If we can flip that on its head and do continual threat monitoring, the idea of starting to see what's coming over the hill at us is, is a really good concept. And for the first time ever, it's a concept that we can introduce, and we can use that to actually try to do something about it, which I'll comment to in a minute. You then need to link that together with SOC, so our Secure Operating Centre. So in other words, what we're having at the moment is a large number of organisations are establishing either their own SOC or they're procuring SOC services from, from another organisation. The problem with that is what does a good SOC look like? A good SOC isn't something that's got a load of tools that nobody turns on or understands, um, but that's generally the way it's sold. And it's not the most sexiest looking kit in the world because 
I don't care what it looks like as long as it actually provides the function. So this concept of having some form of a SOC accreditation is something we're moving towards. And again, I think that's likely to be three or four levels. It will tie in things like ISO 20000, which is the IT infrastructure library element in terms of the management of that process. But it will also tie in outcome-based assessments. So in other words, we'll run attack profiles against the SOC to make sure that they pick them up and react to them appropriately. You tie that together with the threat intelligence, then all of a sudden you're doing monitoring about what's happening on your network traffic, and also you're using threat intelligence to try to anticipate and maybe upping your level of heightened awareness in terms of what's going on in your community at that particular point in time. So in other words, using continual threat analysis or, or, or threat intelligence, what we can do is we can heighten our awareness. So if we see other organisations being attacked, or we see our advocates changing or using different techniques, we raise the profile of that within the organisation, we make sure our SOC is more aware, we make sure our end users are more aware, we make sure our sysadmin people don't, don't take odd telephone calls, we make sure we heighten our physical security, stop people doing drops, and all of the other aspects. And for the first time, we can up that level of awareness based on proper threat intelligence, in other words, contextualised. We can do a configuration review. So if we understand what sort of attacks have been uh, undertaken, we can therefore look at our configuration and think, are we as secure as we should be against this form of attack? So we can review that and maybe make change if necessary. If necessary, we can update, make sure everything's patched, just go through that extra little bit of vigilance to make sure everything is tidied up and you're defended in the best way you can, and maybe even procure a penetration test. So in other words, to validate it in a real life scenario to say, this is the scenario we're anticipating, how good are we to defend ourselves in that, that position? This hasn't been done anywhere. And I think if we can start to build this, then all of a sudden we're going to be much more proactive in terms of what we do, and we can move to this concept for the first time ever in terms of invocation before attack. So in other words, we're seeing the floods coming down the river, and now what we're going to do is lift all the furniture and the kit up to the third floor. You know, it's as simple as that, but in a technical context, this is the first time ever we've had the opportunity to do that. And then finally, we've got recover, which is quite a difficult thing to do. As I've said, it's not as straightforward as you might think, even with things like ransomware. But the idea is that we're trying to develop these schemes uh, to put some structure on it and to enable organisations to understand how to buy good. So in other words, at the time of invocation, when I used to have a professional services firm, if somebody phoned me up and went, we've got a big problem, can you help? I used to really smile, because at that point, I'm not in an open competition ITT. They haven't even mentioned the price to me. Um, they've mentioned the quality or who I'm going to put in there, and basically I'm just going to arrive on the door and do my very best. You know, that's, that's almost as, as good as it gets for a professional services firm. Um, but what we're trying to do is to provide some of that assessment up front in terms of what good looks like. Uh, we're also providing assessment tools that look at that from a perspective of understanding what type of scheme you need at what level, which I also think is really important. So therefore, coming back to this sort of stack, so if we understand that the lowest level is what we need in terms of some form of incident response, right the way up to we really need to understand how to react to this, I think the different levels and the different types of organisations will be, will be quite good in terms of the overall structure of what needs to be done. We're also trying to help by providing maturity models, and again, if you go on the Crest website, these are all free. We've got, we're just about to launch one on penetration testing programmes. Uh, but the cybersecurity incident response maturity model is really good for this. This allows you to assess the level you're at in terms of your level of maturity, not exercising your business continuity plans, but seeing what management structures you've got in place, what escalations you've got in place, what capability you've got within the organisation, and make decisions early and before the invocation about the types of organisations you may wish to utilise should you experience a problem. It's a really good thing. And again, Crest is a not-for-profit organisation that gives this stuff away. It's actually quite a really valuable tool. So what we're trying to do there is reduce the threat through trying to do things to stop people going into crime, reducing the vulnerability through traditional penetration testing and vulnerability assessment, detection through improvements in terms of SOC and in terms of the threat intelligence, and then recovery through trying to make organisations more mature and having selection processes already in place to helping them buy sensible and buy good. As part of the program, I was also asked to, to have a little look at bug bounties. Um, really interesting subject, so almost I've closed one book and I've opened another one now. But bug bounties, I think, is really interesting. It, it went away, and now it's certainly coming back, and there's a lot of people that are now investing some significant money in bug bounty-type activities. 
So individuals or researchers recognised and compensated for finding vulnerabilities. So in other words, organisations opening themselves up to attack by anybody. Um, 1995 was probably around about the first one. Again, Netscape using their bug bounty program. Uh, they put $50,000 aside uh, to pay people if they found. It doesn't actually say how much they spent of that $50,000. Facebook uh, then had their white hat debit card. Uh, you could do everything like buying a t-shirt. Awesome, good. really good value for money, that. Um, and again, what they were trying to do is to, to provide um, the opportunity for people to test a, quite a wide range of their, their portfolio. At the moment, or certainly two years ago, India was the largest number of bug bounties um, in terms of the individuals participating, uh, with an average finding per bug, bear this in mind, it's per bug, not per individual, of about $1,300. Uh, the US came second, around about $2,700, $2,200. Brazil and then the UK, around about three. So you could, you could surmise from that, if you could find a bug, and it's quite significant, it's probably going to be worth on average around about $3,000. Um, Hack the Pentagon um, was also opened. Um, again, I have some real problems with some of the ideas the state's come out with. Um, 138 unique bugs. Um, they made a big song and dance about it. $71,000 is what they, they allocated. Uh, that's an average of $560, $516 per bug. Um, Uber, $5,000 if you can take over their accounts, $10,000 if you can take down their production services. It's a bit of an odd number, that. Um, bearing in mind that you can ransomware somebody like a children's charity and get $9,000 tomorrow. You know, Almost you, you look at the two things and you think, wow, that's an oddity. Um, what's the reality of this? So what you've actually got is a whole host of people, all the people in white there, doing shed loads of work not finding anything at all, or every time they find a bug, somebody else has already found it. And then you've got a few that are actually identifying things and maybe getting a small uh, revenue from it. Then you've got a couple that are identifying stuff, and then you've got some real cream people, um, and they're quite lucky because they're getting early enough, they're actually making a reasonable amount of money. But the vast majority of people make no money for spending an awful lot of time. Um, I'm not saying that's bad. Um, it's a better hobby than sitting there playing Gran, Gran Turismo or something else, but, but I think people need to go in there with their eyes open in terms of what it's all about. And if you look at why some of these things are doing it, and I've spoken to a lot of the bug bounty organisations in the US, which were probably more mature, there is this client view. So the client view is it's a really cost-effective way of finding vulnerabilities. $516 for a major vulnerability, that's pretty good value for the NSA, I think, uh, for a government fed system. A uh, publicly stated level of confidence. I'm confident enough to open my networks out, come and attack me because I'm all right. So therefore, they've probably done a whole pile of testing up front to make sure things are actually quite secure before they open up to a bug bounty program. It's also hacker friendly. Don't want to hack us because you can hack us if you like and if you find stuff and tell us, we'll pay you. That's quite a friendly, you know, I don't like the word hacker, but yeah, but, um, but it's quite interesting in terms of being that friendly person and being open to, to paying people, researchers, for doing this type of work. The issue they've got is complete removal of IPR protection. If they lose all their IPR and they've opened up everything, how are they going to defend themselves? No recourse on unethical issues. So in other words, if they use different forms of attack or start to do things that are really bad, how can you then have a recourse against it? Unresolved vulnerabilities remain in the public domain, um, particularly if you don't pay somebody. Um, so if, if you found a vulnerability somebody else has reported, they don't do anything about it, why wouldn't you dump that in the public? I, I, if I was that way inclined, I probably would. Um, no contractual relationship or protection on either side. So there's no guarantee of payment, and there is no real relationship between that contract, which is quite interesting. Because at that point, you start to have different models, and we're starting to see different models of, of bug bounty coming through. So the target organisation with a virtual handshake to the result researchers. Nothing in place in terms of contractual restrictions. What we're starting to see now is a target organisation with a formal contract with a bug bounty company who then has an informal virtual handshake with the rest of the researchers. So the organisation is trying to protect itself through contracts to the bug bounty organisation who then has an informal relationship with, with a large <coughs> number of people. So it's quite a difficult thing. I do think you need to understand where the money's going and who's got the contractual obligations if you go into this. What we're also looking at here is the employer view could be used for talent spotting, and that's certainly what's happening in the States. The vast majority of people that are finding the significant vulnerabilities are now employed by those organisations. Might be a way of reducing costs, 
why am I paying 80, 90,000 pounds a year for a really good pen tester when I could be paying 516 pounds per availability? It's, a bit, it's quite an interesting business model. Individuals have got the opportunity to hone their talents in their own time. Go away and do your own research, but don't do it on my time. It's quite a good idea. But we are seeing individuals doing work uh, in their firm's time. Or because of their names, they're being associated with their organisation, even though they're doing bug bounty work. And I think as an employer, you'd have to look at that very carefully because you wouldn't normally expect to provide that opportunity for people. Employment contracts, therefore, may preclude this activity, and the use of employee-developed tools may breach their IPRs. So in other words, I've developed my attack tool and my, my particular um, uh, script. Um, if I'm using that and I've developed it in the firm's time and I'm using that to get bug bounty money, then surely the money should come back to the organisation. That's a big IPR issue, I think. The use of shrink wrap products may breach any licensing agreements. So again, if they're using stuff bought by your employer, then if you're using that for a different purpose, that breaches licensing. And the uncontrolled use of internet-based tools can introduce vulnerabilities on your systems as well. So there's quite a difference, and I don't think that's been articulated from the, from the industry. From the researcher's view, potential income, potential kudos within their organisations and within their community, potential employment opportunities for those that aren't currently in work, but they're unsure about their legal position on use of tools, uh, there's no guarantee of payment, and really, some of it is a terrible hourly rate. You, know, you can spend an awful lot of time and get absolutely nothing. Police view. Quite interesting here, because they're trying to get a view on this, and these are the two bits I've got from the police agencies I'm working with. Um, their view is it encourages the use, you've been in there, of illegal software. Um, that, that's pretty close to the mark, really, because if you're actually going to get up into that small group of people that actually make any money at this, you're going to be using some advanced attack tools. And therefore, you're probably going to be downloading explicitly illegal software, which the NCA and some of the other police forces are absolutely against, and you'll probably get a cease and desist notice. You know, so it's quite difficult. And it also provides a potential opportunity for grooming. And therefore, if you're going on those areas, again, the idea of identifying legitimate employers is just exactly the same for other employers, because because the other employers in the cyber-enabled cybercrime absolutely are looking at this as a way of grooming people out. Industry view. I think it's really to be established. We don't know really what we think about it yet. So what I'm asking is, you can help me with this. Um, have you contributed to a bug bounty program? You know, what was your experience? Please let me know. You, know. you can email me directly. I'll have my email on the last slide. Do you have any opinions? You know, is what I'm saying close to the truth, complete rubbish? I don't know. I, I made this up at the moment in terms of what it looks like. I think it's roughly true. I've tried to validate it with a few people, but at the moment, it's just my view. Um, would you be willing to respond to a questionnaire? You know, write to me and say, yes, I would. You know, we've had some experience. I'd like to give you my feedback on this because I think bug bounty is awesome or I've had really bad experiences. And really, I want those balances of the two. And would you be willing to be interviewed? I think it's part of that as well. So really, I'm just providing you with the opportunity to come and help. Provide us with an opinion, volunteer to be interviewed, offer to participate maybe in a workshop, and read the results of the research, because I think it could impact you, and certainly some of the younger people that are attending this event. So that's a really quick run through two quite complicated subjects, but I hope it's given you some idea about the direction of play for both the lower tier penetration testing and vulnerability assessment, and what we're doing in terms of the threat intelligence and the sort of career pathways and the things that are available to people looking at this space. But also that we haven't got the, all the answers and there's new things coming along all the time, which we as, a, as an industry, and if we want to be viewed as being a profession, we have to have an opinion on. And it's your responsibility, I think, to contribute to this. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. We have three minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yep. Um, do you believe that you should uh, be enforced for small and medium businesses? So, like the Cyber Central stuff, do you believe certain schemes that offer like, online services, do you think it should be enforced, what they call it? Yeah. So, the question is um, should, should there be some, some view in terms of whether an organisation has to adhere to a Cyber Central type standard? The UK government is putting it in procurement frameworks right now whether or not it's appropriate to put it in all of those. So if you supply kit for a, a nuclear submarine or, or one of the new um, aircraft carriers, is Cyber Essentials the right thing you should be validated against is a, is a big question. 
I think what we're seeing is going into the procurement frameworks and into supply chain. I wouldn't like it to be a standard because I think it needs to evolve quickly. We, we haven't adequately considered cloud uh, or how we accredit cloud type services. And I think there's some other bits that fit around it, like awareness and things that I think we should actually put in there if we're going to suggest this is a level and, and demonstrability of assurance. So, so, so we're talking about different forms of bug bounty. So, so the answer is, I haven't investigated that in very much detail at all. I know it's going on, and it's just a different way of trying to recompense somebody for the amount of time they're spending. And also, it pulls together the concept of having a group, um, group research opportunity where you can come together and actually do things together. I think it's not a bad idea. I think it struggles with some of the same problems we've got in terms of contractual obligations. But again, write to me. I'm really interested, genuinely, I'm really interested to try to get a view on what these things are. And if there's variations on how these schemes have been implemented, I'd really like to know. I've got no idea, really, what the legal implications are. So if, if you allow people to attack you, as I say, I think the legal position is you can leave your doors and windows open. Um, at that point, your insurance company probably won't pay, and I don't think law enforcement are going to be that interested in helping you. So it falls into that type of area. I don't think law, and I don't think insurance has a view on this at all, um, which again is why I think this is quite a valid piece of research, so we have some view. I should have probably put insurers down on that list. I didn't think about it, and for the next presentation on this, it will be there. Sorry. If there's a new silk under the chair market, I think you can either see that there are just people who are actually they are. Uh, they, they still chat on this back to the people who are able to feed them or whatever that's going to fit against the kind of organization. So yes, fair to you. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, there's another question. Yeah. I'm just going to ask in terms of bring the cyber sanctuary as well. I don't understand that the software organizations can define the scope of that testing. So how does that come through in output in terms of so we're talking about the scope of a cyber essentials view. If if you look at the definition that I was originally given by by CSG as it was at the time in terms of this, then they were saying all of your internet facing connections should form part of your cyber essentials review. That's a big thing. When we launched it, Barclays, somebody from Barclays, a senior person, stood up and said, we are committed to put Barclays through Cyber Essentials. And you can see the guy who's responsible for it go white. Really, you know, because how many interconnections have they got and how many outward-facing things they've got to the internet? It's a massive undertaking. So at that point, you've got to think about the scoping issues. Um, as I say, I think people are manipulating the standard. Um, I do think we should have a scope statement in there now, which we don't have. We do in 27,001. At the moment, we don't have that in terms of cyber essentials. It's a company certificate. Uh, but I think we should, at the very minimum, introduce the same definition of what the scope includes as we do within a 27,001 review. It's one of the reasons why, if they'd have given me homework to look at large enterprise, I wouldn't have come up with the idea of cyber essentials and cyber essentials plus in its current form. Or saying that, I still really like it as a standard. Thank you, and we're out of time now, so apologies for that. Um, the next presentation in here is at 4 o'clock, I think. Thank you very much.